Hey, thanks for joining us on the From the Bench podcast presented by Projectile Warehouse. I'm your host, Taylor Weezy, and this podcast is going to revolve around phone calls that you might make from your reloading bench to fellow reloaders and experts in the field. Today, we have none other than Mr. Paul Janzo sitting across from me. Uh, we've just shot a club, club match today here at Monado and uh, very hot, hot and testing conditions. How'd you go today, Paul? Well, I got in the top 10, which I'm always happy to be in. Ninth, so <laughs> yeah, 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 nice. Yeah, you, I'm, I'm more than happy. You, PRS is a pretty new thing for you, right? You've shot years of F class and hunting for a, quite a long time, and yeah. this is a, a new sport. And I, well, I, I did cut my teeth in IPSC, but that was with pistols. Um, the rifles got taken off us right early in the part when I started in the IPSC, but um, I heard about you know Rusty having this style of shooting. Uh, happening. This is um, a few years ago, and I delved and I found someone that said, "Oh, here's a number for Rusty." And um, I was lucky enough to meet him while he was still shooting out at uh, Kai Kai. The matches there. I shot a couple matches and then um, jumped straight in the deep end with the, one of the first shoots in Mildura. And uh, um, well, I shot terribly, but I still <laughs> I didn't come last. But yeah. I had a ball of a time, you know. Yeah, hell nice. of a good time, you know. Nice. So you've been shooting for what, like a good part of, uh, like, have you been shooting since you were real little, or is it something uh, you since picked I was up? five years old? Yeah. And well, I'm just sixty one, so I wasn't going to ask you how old you were, but that's <laughs> very generous go. of you to let me know. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, so and reloading the whole time, or was that something you picked up the more you got into it? Um, I started reloading pretty well. I think it was about no, uh, brrr, seventeen, six, no, nineteen when I first got my first little Lee kit. Mm. One of the ones that used a hammer or mallet yeah, with, wow. and um, started with thirty-eight super. No, not thirty-eight super. That's a pistol cartridge. Thirty-eight special, mm -hmm. and um, a little Martini Cadet single shot. That was, um, I think, Sprinter used to rebarrel them or or bore the barrel out and. Um, Set them up, you know, as a little three, five, seven, yeah, thirty-eight nice. special ram. Nice. And yeah, so, yeah, how long would it take to make? You know, like w things are getting quite fast now with how quickly we can reload rounds with you know new machinery and things like that, new presses and new powder throwers. But back then, when you were working with, like you were saying like a hammer type setup and a and a die and a hammer, how long was that taking you to, you know, go from sizing a case to to charging a case? Like, what were you looking at? Well, it's. Oh, just a guess, maybe five minutes around, because you resize and then you've got to take the case out of the resizer, pardon me, prime it, then um, get the powder scoop, scoop that in. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, no, usually you build the case just slightly because it's a straight walled case. Mm -hmm. Powder, um, drop the projectile in, put in another die and tap it with a hammer gingerly, you know, yeah, hopefully right. it's not going to blow up. So that's how you, the hammer tapping was, that was seeding the yeah. projectile, wasn't yeah. it? You had something you were tapping in. Yeah. Wow, so your control over your seeding depth was, you know, how were you able to do that it consistently? It was basically reset. It was set by the lead um, sets that yeah. were sold at the time. Yeah. Yeah, so okay. that's how they came, you know. Yeah, so you had to change, if, if that was your, if your seeding depth was set by that kit, what were you using to change group size and actually get those rounds accurate? Well, that's when I went into the press side of things mm -hmm. and um, they, they had the little Lee, uh, not Lee, the Simplex turret press. Yeah. And uh, they had the very small dies. The, oh, I forget the, the size that they were, but um, that's when I started um, getting into the more yep. accurate side of things, you know. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Reloading was a whole new ball game, and then yeah, then it just went on. Went to the O frame press, you know, with the big seven eight by fourteen dies, and yeah, oh no, you got to do your seating depth. That's you know when it all started, really. Yeah, you know, but the Lee press, it was that's how it comes out. You just go and shoot, and yeah, Lee team seemed to turn, work things out. You know, yeah, right. They obviously did a lot of testing in the back end to figure oh. out putting oh. you in a zone that was going to be. You know, yeah. pretty. I, I guess so, and I guess that you know everything was loaded to a standard size. You mm. know, and yeah. yeah. And you did you enjoy reloading from the very start? Was it something you fell in love with quickly, or was it as you got better at it over the years of doing it that you started to really enjoy 
having that ability to tune a rifle to to shoot well. I enjoyed it from the start because I really like making things go bang. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, you know, later on in life, um, you know, I um, bought several rifles and um, then I got into the target side of things, you know, the, well, the hunting side of things. And, you know, you had to be fairly accurate. So, you know, that's when I started learning, um, you know, bullet seating depths and, you know, don't just cram the bullet in and jam it, you know, because yep. you can come unstuck. But yep. um, seating depth played a, a role in, in powder charges and, you know, yep. I mucked around a lot, you know, because I had a little Southern Vales Club where I could go any time, you know, I had a key there and mm-hmm. you could go in and, in an afternoon. Yeah, set cool. up stuff and um, I would, you know, take your loaded rounds. Yeah, awesome. Um, set up your targets, see what group best, you know. Then you then you muck around with seating depths with certain charges and yeah. Then um, what was the availability of of components back when you were sort of first getting into? It? Was there a huge selection of different powders, or were you a little bit more limited than than we are now with components? When I first started, it was basically IMI. Yep, uh, or Dupont powders. Mm-hmm. They tended to have a, a good range, mm-hmm. um, but I remember some of the old gunsmiths saying, "Oh, I think it was a equivalent to three hundred three one, which uh, what would that be? Two hundred six, I think. Mm-hmm. Or now it's two hundred six H. That used to be called cannon fodder, cannon powder. Yeah, right. Yeah, and and these old guys used to buy bulk lots of it. And, yeah, and Oh, you can load so much in there, but don't go over that charge. You'll blow yeah. up your case or something, you know. So a lot of it was um, knowledge from around the club and different people you were talking to. There wasn't – nowadays we can jump online. I was talking with, you know, with Plushy recently about the amount of articles online and different websites you can read to get a good starting point nowadays. But you were obviously back then having to just talk to other shooters that had tried things and experienced things. Well, talk to other shooters, yeah, but also got – Two books, Nick Harvey's reloading book, mm-hmm. um, which was pretty informative. I think people still use that now, don't they? It's yeah, quite and I a think good he's book. still alive too. Yeah, okay. And uh, um, uh, one book that I had for years was the Hornady reloading manual, mm-hmm. and that gave you a really good starting point. Mm-hmm. Some, you know, and I, I used to sort of start about halfway and then work my way up. I suppose I went, I was in the speed sort of generation. Got to make yeah. it go fast. <laughs> yeah, right. So that was that was the thing, was it? Everyone was trying to find that load that shot well and went as fast as possible. Was that... Yeah. Was that come, yeah. Do you uh, think that yeah. comes from a... I, I can see the, the point for that from a hunting background. Obviously, the velocity is going to create more energy on target. You're going to... Mm. You know, you're taking game. So obviously, you want that, that knockdown impact. But then yep. for target shooting, you're wanting consistency. And sometimes the consistency comes at a lot slower node where the, the round's doing the same thing over and over but at a slower speed the, the higher speeds can be a bit more finicky and a bit more peaky mm. What do you think that's where it came from the crossover from the hunting or everyone just thought we're going to cut the wind better if we're going faster well we never really thought of wind we just thought because our days in hunting it wasn't all that far it's not like the yeah the, you know, the Americans where they go out in their varmint shooting yep. they call it and sit there on a hill and shoot way out yonder but, oh, no, we just wanted to go fast. But we didn't have chronographs. We just sort of said, the book says we're going this fast. Oh, yeah. well, you know, let's, yeah. let's, get, let's, let's put a bit more in and see how accurate it is. Yeah, okay. But we wanted accuracy as well as, um, you know, velocity. Mm-hmm. You know, so we could, if we can see, a, you know, a goat over there, you know, let's, let's shoot it, you know. Yeah. But we didn't have dial scopes and all that sort of no. thing. We sighted it. 100 metres and usually we'd set it an inch or an inch and a half high and there's usually spot on at 200. And, and a little bit of hold over at, yeah, at 300, yeah. yeah. What what sort of distances were you you're taking, game man? I mean, the things have changed nowadays with laser range finders and like you said, scopes with the ability to dial mm. um, dope into them. And so the game's gotten, you know, people are making long distance sh- hunting shots quite ethically, quite consistently. But oh, that's for right. you guys, what... Sort of three hundred meters and in, sort of thing back then, or yeah, within three hundred meters. Yep. and a lot was in spotlighting. So, them days the spotlights weren't all that that good. Mm-hmm. Um, oh well, you had the big night eater spotlight that everyone's oh he's got a night eater. He's got a night eater, and you know the <laughs> <laughs> you, you turn your little um, night force 
the you know light force light on it just disappears you know yeah mm. right but um yeah we never really shot that far mm-hmm. but um I did have a job uh, when I was with the council um, doing fox baiting through the Ongapringa Gorge mm-hmm. and uh, one of the national parks guys said oh look you know I'll take you for a drive and show you where all these uh, fox baiting stations are and uh, I said oh there's a lot of goats through here and he said oh you need a license cha-ching yeah you had one um, you need a good <laughs> rifle but <Ba-ding>. ding <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, here come some goats. Yeah. Have a go at those. Six goats, well, six shots, six goats, you know. Yeah. Oh, well, yes, you you have written permission to shoot goats through the Ongabringa Gorge. Oh. Yeah, and so... How long did you keep that up for? Are you still shooting goats in that gorge or you no, cleaned them out now? No, that was, oh, that was quite a few years ago now. Yeah. Um, no, just for the year when yep. I did that fox baiting for the year. Yeah. But the longest shot I took, I, I shot across the gorge... At a goat, there was a goat standing side on. There was one standing side on underneath it. I, I gave it the big Kentucky windage and elevation, as they, they yeah. say. Took the shot and decked the goat that was standing underneath the the little. I shot the little oh, goat, right. not the big goat that I was going for. Yeah. So that's how much drop. So there's yeah, a goat sort of what meter foot, and a half off the foot, ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four foot drop, meter half drop. Yeah. Yeah, and I aimed, you know, a, over the top. Yeah, probably a meter above it. Yeah, you know, so that yeah. was that was you know one, one of the longest shots of yeah taken on game. That, yeah, you know, but then I um, sort of got into the IPSC side of things, mm-hmm. and um, still kept up the spotlighting because mm-hmm. they had some nice little properties and farmers to look after. You mm-hmm. know. When you were shooting IPSC, were you making your own projectiles? Were you doing cast lead, making your own projectiles for that? No, I had a good um, friend in the club there that had a one of those automatic, almost well, an early type of machine, a Redding or RCBS, mm-hmm. and it shuffled the rounds sideways. Through oh. it. it wasn't a circular turret. Yeah, and um, he used to do my reloading pretty cheaply. Yeah, and um, but I'd always. Make sure the rounds dropped in the barrel and dropped out. Yeah, do a yeah. quick, quick yeah. check. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, so what what has been throughout your reloading journey? I know we were talking just quickly before we jumped on the podcast. What is the thing that you're m- like most passionate about about reloading? What gets you I- excited with it? I, I see you helping a lot of other people with their reloading. Is that something that you enjoy tuning other people's rifles for them as well? I really, really do. Yeah, yeah. You know, I get my rifles working as accurate as I want, you know, under three quarter inch, yep. under three quarter MOA. Um well we're talking MOA yeah. accuracy, yeah. You know, yeah. Half if if I can get it at three quarter MOA, I'm super happy with that shooting this this um discipline. Mm-hmm. You know, and um if I see people struggling, I'll help them if I can. Mm-hmm. You know, if um they want to take my advice, you know I'm happy to go around and, you know, help them set up their dies for reloading, that sort of thing, mm-hmm. you know. Getting your shell, you know, your dies set is, is a, you know, a very important part, you know, of the reloading cycle. Mm-hmm. Get your dies set, then, then you work on your powder charge, your seating depth. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I really thoroughly enjoy that. Yeah, yeah. and what what's your what's your process? So you... you Let's say you've got a new rifle or you've just rebarreled or something. Mm-hmm. What's your process to find a, a load for that rifle? Well, usually start out with new brass with everything. Yep. New barrel, new brass. Um, make sure we've got uh, um, the, the Hornady uh, gate, the, the cartridge case that's been drilled out and tapered. Uh, oh, the overall length overall gauge. Length gauge. Yep, yep. Um, need one that you know fits in the barrel, of course, yep. and um, we'll work on your seating depth. Right, so you're finding that you're finding where your lands are in the barrel first. So That's you've got exactly that right. measurement so of where I'll they are. I measure that several times mm-hmm. and, and make sure it's it's the same each time, mm-hmm. and uh, write that down. So there's your length to the lands. So from there you start working back, yep. you know, with, with the jump. Mm-hmm. Uh, in F class, uh, I shot um, the Berger VLD bullets, and they technically said, well, they like a jam. Mm-hmm. And I always started them with a 10 tower jam. Mm-hmm. And as I was shooting uh, competitions or, you know, state matches, state team matches or open prize meets, 
club shoots, you know, I'd notice that just a bullet would drop every now and then out of the group. Okay, I'd you'd have go, one random flyer coming out. Yeah, yep. but it always dropped down the bottom, and I'd go home, check my, um, how far the throat had eroded, and, um, yeah, it was surprising that, you know. How quickly it, that, that, was, that number was moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I used to shoot a 300 Winchester short magnum. That's a lot of powder. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, 210 grain bullets. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I was very competitive, you know. Yeah, you've you've made state teams for F class and stuff, haven't you? And yeah. Shot like yeah. high high national level F class stuff, which yeah. is a you know that's a F class is a discipline that I admire and look up to. Like mm-hmm. as a PRS shooter, you know we're sort of off wobbly barricades and moving around heaps and throwing heaps of lead out there. But you guys, it's that you know you've got your what your twenty shots or whatever, and you've got to make make them count. Make and them you're count, reading yeah. the wind, and it's very. It's more of a finely tuned machine. It sort of happens a lot slower, but you've got to, that level of accuracy is is yeah. higher. Yeah, um, and well, in the F class, you've got all the flags down range, and you know you, you've got to watch for direction, wind change, and you know, um, it could be coming straight across from you. Then the flags are slowly turning around to a mm-hmm. forty-five degree. Mm-hmm. If you don't see that, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're out of the scene. You're out of the game. Yeah, out of the game. Yeah, right. So. So once you notice, let's go like back to you notice that with jamming those bullets into the lands, you notice that you were having that those ones drop out occasionally as that throat was eroding forward. How did you solve that puzzle? Did you start trying to find an uh, an accurate load with more jump? I stuck with the same load. I just jammed the bullets. I just seeded them further oh, out. Oh, so you started chasing them forward. Yeah, yeah right. I well, what you would call forward. chasing the lands. Yeah. yeah, and it would come to a point where no, that's far enough. I'd just have the threads cut off, rechambered. Mm-hmm. Re- re-threaded, screwed back in, same load, go again. Okay, all right. Mm. But obviously I, I was lucky. <laughs> for, I, I spoke with Plushy a lot about this too, like obviously for the PRS stuff we're doing, let's say you shoot 200 rounds in a weekend mm-hmm. in a national level competition, yep. that throat erosion is it's a couple thou, like it's moving. Yep. So you, that that theory of jamming a bullet in the lens is not going to work for our style of shooting or for hunting, is it? Yeah, um, I wouldn't, I would not, use that style of sh- um, uh, loading. seating depth or, mm-hmm. you know, loading for our style of shooting. Mm-hmm. You know, you, we get a cease fire, take your round out or time's up and you pull that round out and it's jammed in the barrel. You Put powder it, it all can, through it you. It can put you out for a few courses of fire, you know, if Cleaning you have to all the powder pull your out. Gu- rifle apart, clean the powder out. Push the know. projectile out, mm. yep. Yeah, I believe I saw someone do that today, so it mm. does still happen. <laughs> yes, we know that, who that happened to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we won't say any names, yeah. but that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, right. And so was is is that still how you would load around for an F-class gun or are you now jumping bullets further? Or are you finding those nodes further out? What are you, what are you looking for now? I, w- I wouldn't jam bullets, you know, in any form of shooting now I, I'd, I'd look for that uh, that happy yep. that happy group you know mm-hmm. um, off the lands mm-hmm. like um, I'm in the Mount Barker Rifle Club as well and there was a new member there and I shoot sporting hunter class and um, I put my hand up and said look anyone else that comes along I'm happy to you know guide them and all that sort of thing ring ring oh we've got a new guy he's just brought a rifle can you help him sure can so I helped him one guy said, throw away your Starline brass. Well, yeah, Starline brass. I said, no. Yeah, that's that's what I'm using, mate. I used it today. And what yeah. did I come? I was, oh, this is going to be Third. a self-brag. Yeah, Third. there you go. I'm glad that you said it. And yeah. I didn't say it. Third. Yeah. And how many points behind second was I today? Um, no, I thought it was fifth point, a half a second. Yeah, it was half a second. Yeah, I was just, just a couple of time behind. Yeah. Yeah, it was only... Beaten by time. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Starline Brass is fine. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking to a about. Champion yeah. here, you know. <laughs> Top three. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, and he said, Oh, you've got to jam those bullets. They'll lap you a Yep. You've got to jam them uh, 10th hour. He said, Paul, oh, I have to throw away my Starline Brass, jam these bullets 10th hour. I said, Hold on. Do not load like that. Yep. Keep that Starline Brass. I've asked you to weight batch your brass. Mm hmm. To get the the most consistency out of it, do not throw your star line brass away. If you're going to throw it away, give it to me. Yeah, I'll find <laughs> somewhere to use it. Yeah. I will use it. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I asked another good um, uh, reloader because I, um, like I said, I don't use. I've never used lapis and ears. I've never known what they wanted to 
how, mm-hmm. how they like being seated. Mm-hmm. And um, this very knowledgeable guy said they are a very forgiving bullet. Yeah, I think that you Lockie at our club here, he shoots them in his 6.5 Creed and he said that same thing to me. He yep. can pretty much put them anywhere and they, and they yep. shoot really easily. So. Yeah, so I started him at 25, 35 um, and he shot those two groups and, uh, you know, on the, on the day and they shot well. Mm-hmm. Then I said, next week we're going 40, 45. And he said, oh, I'm going to load, you know, five, ten thou off the land. So I said, don't bother. We'll shoot, you shoot these at 40 and 45. The yeah, 40, 45 the 45 thou. thou off the lands was an open group, but he sh- still shot a 49, I think. The wind got him on one shot. Mm-hmm. Then he shot the 45 thou jump and it was a, tightest little group I've ever seen and, yeah. and I said well there you go what are you going to load now you're going to load 10th hour jam yeah 10th hour jump or 45 there yeah because um, we shoot on electronic target so you've got you can you know look up your target any time and and uh, he was just over the moon and yeah yeah that's that's so cool and that backs up with what I've just sort of spoken on the podcast with Plushy about and about the seating depth stuff and and there is this very I don't. I wouldn't say it's old school. But I guess it is like this methodology of jamming or seating quite close to the lands and chasing mm. it. And and maybe you can get this absolute smallest group up there really close. But like you're saying, it's going to be um, a high maintenance load. You're going to have to check it regularly. You're going to have to check your lands as they move. You're going to have to do a lot of work to keep it in that sweet spot, aren't you? Absolutely. Whereas this, like you're saying, a forty-five thousand jump it should continue to shoot as those, you know, as the barrel erodes a little bit, you got mm. you got that more forgiveness at those bigger jump nodes. That's right. Like in this competition, going by these Lapua Saneers, you know, you could load up rounds for, you know, the, the up-and-coming uh, competition we got and um, load them at 40, 40 thou. Mm. And um, the, the throat... By the end of the yeah, match, it's going to wear yeah. and it'll be 40, almost 45. And, and you know they shoot well work, there. You know? yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's what what a lot of guys are doing is they're finding they're finding a seating depth that w- shoots a good group, but then they're also testing either side of that, like mm. testing a little bit closer, a couple yep. of thou closer and a, and a couple of thou longer so mm. that if you you know don't seat one quite deep enough or you, you seat one too deep or whatever, or like you're saying, the, 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 the lands move a little bit over the course of fire, mm. you're still in that, that sort of sweet spot there. That's right. So you're yeah. able to kind of keep it there. That's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Have you uh, ever found a load or a caliber or something that you couldn't get to shoot? What's been your, your biggest battle with a rifle that you've had? Um, actually, I, I got talked into building a, or not building, putting together. Putting together. <laughs> we have these charges for you. You're not building a house, no, are you? No. You're <laughs> assembling parts. Yeah. Assembling a rifle with a, well, I, I used the Barnard Actions mm-hmm. in the in for F class in the surrounded Winchester Magnum, which actually worked really good for me in one of the Queensland Queens. Um, I tried two to one three SC. Yep, two to one three shortcut powder. Yep, shortcut. Yep. It would not shoot. I tried. Pardon me. The VLD bullets. So technically, they like to jam. Mm-hmm. I went right up and down the powder scales. I tried. Then I tried jumping them. They just shot like a shotgun. Yeah. Tried two to one seven, and it was just instant. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there, there was. Like several, uh, two nodes, I think. And uh, I just went up in the powder charge. And uh, you could see, you know, it wasn't a very good, well, it was an open group. But then it closed. Then as I went up in the powder charge, it opened a bit, then it closed again. Yeah, right. And that was 76, 76 and a half grains. Mm-hmm. And um, even guys today say that, that load that you found for the 300 Winnie Mag is just a ball terror. You know, yeah, it, right. it just works. Yeah, right. You know, having trouble with a Winnie Mag, 76 grains of 2217. Is is 2217 slower or faster powder? Slow, the slower powder. Yeah, that, yeah. that makes sense. Like I've, I've seen, a, um, so I've sort of been on the podcast plugging other, you know, other YouTubers, other podcasts that we listen to to get our info from. And, and there's mm-hmm. a couple that I'm not sure if you've seen on YouTube called Mark and Sam After Work. Oh, they yeah, do a lot yeah. of long distance and mm-hmm. like terrific shooters. Like yeah. they are amazing what they're doing in their long distance stuff. So obviously their reloading is on point as well. They're yeah. obviously reloading mm. very consistent rounds. And he had 
a comparison he did between a, a 300 PRC and a 300 Win Mag. Mm -hmm. And he was finding that, that the long slender case of mm -hmm. the 300 Win Mag yep. really enjoys a, a slow powder in a nice long barrel because yep. you're getting that nice long steady push mm -hmm. of that heavy projectile all the way out the barrel. Yep. Whereas um, if you're trying to you know, uh, have a – he was struggling with a shorter barrel or whatever, that's when – maybe the PRC, the 300 PRC has an advantage because it's got that slightly shorter fatter case with a steeper shoulder. There, It burns more of the powder in the case than the wind mag does, whereas the wind mag's burning a lot of that powder as the projectile's sort of moving yeah. down the barrel, sort of like the firing of the the, the, the combustion's happening yeah. in a slightly different spot. Mm -hmm. And he was saying exactly what you're saying. If you've got a nice slow burning powder with a heavy projectile in a 300 wind mag, mm -hmm. give it that gentle push. And he said that it was working amazing for him. He was yeah. really, really, really getting good um, results. Did you get the PRC mixed up with the WSM? Uh, no, no. I know the WSM, 300 WSM is an even shorter case again, isn't it? But yeah. the, he was doing a direct comparison between the the PRC and the and the wind mag and he was finding that they're very very similar right. but he was able to get the wind mag to do what the PRC does once he had that um yeah. that sorted with a you know the, yeah. the, a longer barrel and the, the slow powder and everything that was working yeah. for a good push but oh cuz I just put together a well no last year found a second hand barrel that was just in 308 and yeah you know there's nothing wrong with it only had a couple hundred rounds through it got nicked to Fit it in PRC, yes. Round of PRC, and yes. um, oh, I thought that was a little bit bigger than the WSM. Okay, <coughs> mm. yeah, right. It, and so, what what have you found with the three hundred PRC versus? Well, let's talk about that. Like versus, so you had that load that absolutely shot for the three hundred Winnie Mag. Did that load transfer over to the three hundred PRC, I or about ten more grains of powder with the same sort of powder? Yeah, okay, two to one seven. Okay, yeah, yeah. and yeah. it's still shooting absolutely amazing. Oh yeah, yeah, right, yeah. I okay. loaded up some of Steve's um, outer edge projectiles, one fifty fives, because the barrels only a one in ten twist, and his projectiles like a, a slightly very fast twist, to, a yeah. very quick twist. And um, yeah, I've got those one fifty five steaming. Yeah. And um, yeah, initial test was just a, a clover leaf hole. Yeah. You know, with three shots. That's awesome. But then I was I, I found the happy medium. You know, with that. That first load, all the other loads, you know, um, they opened, the groups opened up. Mm -hmm. So I just stuck with that one well, load. What were you, for you, what is the advantage of going a 300 PRC, which is a relatively new cartridge, over a 300 Win Mag? Oh, because I can. Because you can. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something to try. Yeah. Yeah, something to try. They're practically the same thing, aren't they? They're doing. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's right. Um, well, uh, the, this round of Winnie Mag came along cheap. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's one of the Remington Police models, the early one. Mm -hmm. Had a brake on it, you know, um, you know, nice bolt handle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, tapered rail on it, so there's, yeah. you know, there's, you know, added value to it. Yeah. In in the solid, uh, what are they? The, uh, the, you know, the stocks they come in anyway. Yeah. They're, they're quite a solid stock. Yeah. And um, and PRC went ting, a little, you know, a little... Yeah, monkey on my shoulder. Going, yeah, try this. PRC, go yeah, Nick, can you rechamber this? Yeah. yeah, sure can. Yeah, unfortunately, that rifle won't fit in my safe, so it's sort of <laughs> yes. Yeah, because the barrel I got was real long. You got a real long. What what length barrel are you? Oh, it's about thirty two or something. Okay, like barrel. Yeah. yeah, and that is a yeah. F class build or a hunting build. It was a um, XF class barrel. For some reason, they didn't like it. You mm -hmm. know, it's just chambered in three hundred eight. So. Um, in a heavy Palmer profile, mm -hmm. stuck a, um, a Terminator brakes on it. I think it was from the good guys out at uh, in Victoria. Yep. And uh, yeah, that really tamed it, you know. Yep. But yeah. I, I um, yeah, I want to find you know a happy medium with say the 185 Juggernaut. See what speed I can get them going. Zoom them out accurately. Yeah. yeah. But um. That's I found that load and it's just been put away. You know, yeah. I shot it at thousand yards. I've shot it at a mile. And yeah, I will achieve that. So yeah, well, I shot it a mile. <laughs> that's a, what's a mile? That's one point six k's, isn't it? That's yeah. a that's a yeah. long way. Yeah, something what, like that. What sort of size target are you, are you still? Oh, a that was just that was quite a big plate, twenty four mm -hmm. inch plate. Yeah, yeah. That's still an that's impressive fairly, poke. Yeah, fairly strong side wind that day. Gusty side wind. Yeah. Thousand yards, the wind was over the back, and it was just sort of boringly accurate, you know. 
bang, hit, bang, hit, bang, hit. Yeah. Because, you know, the bullet's going that quick. Yeah. You know. Mate, that's so impressive. Something like 3,500 feet a second. Mm-hmm. Mm. Nice. <laughs> well, it sounds like you've loaded, like, pretty much every calibre there is to reload. Like, And I know at the moment, currently... I feel like you rock up here at the club with a, a different gun every week, or you share you, you bring a gun along for someone to shoot, and it's either a, you've got you've got a twenty two two fifty sort of rig that's shooting heavier projectiles for a PRSE type yeah. setup, and then you've got PRS your F class type, yeah, you know. yeah, that you've lent to some people, and you're hmm. shooting. You were shooting a two sixty today, two sixty yeah. Remington, yeah, a rusty old rifle. Yeah, <laughs> is that your main PRS comp gun? No, no, huh? I've got a um, Kelby Atlas Tactical. Uh huh. Um, I'm just having the. Uh, I had a um, quick change lug fitted to it, but I'm not happy with it. Spoke to the smith, and he said, "Not a problem. We'll sort it." Mm. You know, which is what I like about Nick. Yeah, he just gets it done. Yeah, he, he you know he does look after you, and yeah. Um, yeah, I've got three barrels for that: six, six Creedmoor, six five Creedmoor, and two sixty AI. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and what barrel is on it currently at the moment? Uh, I screwed the 260 AI in it, um, but I want to get it altered before I go ahead and shoot it again. So. Okay. What are you going to go to? You're going to shoot the up-and-coming uh, Monado Meltdown, the first PRS national event for the year. What what yep. chamber are you going to be running? What cartridge are you going to be running for that? Probably just the 6X. Uh, not 6 XC, Creed? Uh, 6 Creed. Okay. Yeah. Yep. As long as Nick can get that done for in us, time. you know, in time. What he projectile are you shooting out of that 6 Creed? Um, I'm just... Happy with the Hornady ELDs, one hundred and eight, uh, one hundred and eight ELDs, are, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they work well, yeah. Um, the same loaders. I, I contact, you know, message Prussy. Oh, what can I start at? You know, he's, oh, forty grains of oh nine. Yeah, bang, came third that day. Yeah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Just worked for you. Um, you know, came in fresh barrel, sighted on the target. You know, uh, chronographed it, put the data into my JBM site, which I've always used. Yeah. Uh, tested it, you know, 500, wind it in, bang, ding. Oh, that works. That worked. <laughs> Some days it just comes together. I guess a lot yeah. of that for you is there's so much experience. It is an estimated guess, but your estimated guess is backed up with a lot of knowledge and a lot of trying other things there. It's not, you yeah. know, it's not just a, you know, a yeah. random, random load you've thrown together. It's got some sort of knowledge behind it yeah. from previous experience. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, this, this load that I um, put in today, you know, it, I had a, um, a, lo a load that I first started with the 260. It was, it was quite a warm load. Mm. And, um, yeah, so I've had to back that down. It was very accurate. Yeah. Um, but I've had to tune it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, some of those cases that were shot with that warmer load, um, yeah, fell apart. Okay, yeah. So, so we had some trouble with some loose primer pockets today, didn't you? Yeah, yeah it wasn't a trouble. They, they still ejected. They still, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and that that uh, shooting at Mount Bark, that's where I can do this extra mm -hmm. testing, you know, and you've got the electronic target, instant mm -hmm. feedback, you know, and you can look your targets up any time you like. Yeah. You know, it's on a website there. Yeah. So that really helps and, you know, you've got instant feedback. You know. I, I think, like, the thing I'm learning, uh, being a member of this club here and, and talking to other shooters is, ha like, the, the knowledge base and the resources available to people by being a member of a club, yeah. like any club, you know, sort of any club that shoots any sort of bench rest, F class, you know, PRS, whatever it is, there's mm. people around those clubs like yourself that have been doing a whole heap of different disciplines and reloading for a long time. So mm. even if you are, if you are just an avid hunter, but you want to get into reloading, mm. going to one of those clubs, either becoming a member or just going to a shoot every now and then and, and meeting some people is very advantageous for having a bit of a mentor, you know, and finding someone who's going to go. Because people are so willing to, to offer up advice, aren't they? Well, that's true. And, you know, I've asked a lot of people along, you know, that have, have started shooting, you know, oh, I want to go hunting, you know, or well, have you sighted your rifle in? Oh, no, I bought it, but the guy said it was sighted in. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, we're going to a range, you know. Yeah. Like Southern Vales, I can go down there on a Sunday afternoon. So, mm. come on, all right, show me how well it shoots, you know. Yeah. Oh. oh, I can't hit the target. Yeah. yeah. So you're going to go hunting. <laughs> 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 Not with that rifle. Yeah, right. And so, you know, there's a little bit of education on, you know, sighting the rifle in and, you know. Confirming get, zero. Confirming and, right, now what do I do? But, you know, the, the word 
but I know someone else that doesn't like it, you know. Yeah. But what if I do this? You're not doing that. You, you've, here's your ammo. We're shooting that. You've got it on target at 100. We set the turrets or your scope for 100. All right. Maybe set a little bit higher for, you know, that if you, just the hunting situation. Yeah. Um, but, you know, get out and practice. Mm. Practice, you know. Yeah. Get out and practice, you know, if you, if you want to hunt, you know. <laughs> I've always laughed, you know, someone will put a big 460 Weatherby Magnum together and they'll go down to the range and they'll get punished sighting it in then they'll put it in the cupboard and they, they go on a big hunt and yep. they're too and scared to shoot it. or put three shots down it or something. Three shots yeah. down it and, you know, they, they just don't know the rifle. You know. Yeah. You've got to be in tune. You've really got to be in tune with, you know, with your equipment. what you're doing with your equipment, you know. Yeah, that's totally true. Yeah. I think a lot of people have said that to me. They've said... Shoot a season of PRS and then watch your hunting improve. They've said watch, watch. You know when you're shooting under the clock, under time pressure, and there's different distances, different size targets, and you're having to make wind calls and things like that. And then they said go and then hunt from there, and everything mm. slows down. Like you know you you're yeah. used to being on the clock and doing things fast and shooting a really small target, and then mm. your hunting will improve from there as well. Well, the the shooting side of your hunting. I mean, obviously, yeah. your stalking and all that's a totally different ball game. But oh, that's right. but your actual application of how you manoeuvre and how you crack a shot off with yep. that firearm. You see it, your yeah. trigger control, everything, you know. Mm. <coughs> it all comes into play, doesn't it? Yeah, it yeah. does. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about reloading gear. Mm. Uh, you said you started with that, that original yep, Lee kit. Yeah, what? How many kit. progressions of that have you gone through? So, so how many different presses have you had and, and take us up to where you're at now? And mm -hmm. maybe is there any parts that have gone with you through the whole journey? Do you have a, a beam scale or something that you used at the beginning that you still trust here at the end? Or are you is your process and the equipment you reload, reload on now very different than it was when you started? Yeah, it is. Well, it's, it's gone a full circle. Um, I started... With the Lee, well, pardon me, the um, little Lee, basically, Lee loader. <coughs> Went to the uh, Super Simplex uh, turret press that takes the small little dies and that yeah. only neck sizes. Yeah. You know, you can't full length size with them. Um, then I went to a no frame, a RCBS, one of the real solid O frame presses. Is it a rock chucker? Is that what they would call it? Would have been a, yeah, would have been a rock Something chucker. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, very heavy press and, you know, you can size anything in it, you know. Yeah. And um, I I got into pistol shooting, so I loaded pistol, I loaded triple two, two four three, um, yeah, two five seven. Roberts improved, you know, on on that press, and and I had a beam scale, a no house beam scale that's equivalent to the uh, RCBS ten ten, mm -hmm. yeah, very accurate scale. Yeah, I'd sit there and trickle the powder in, and then. Or it into the case, and you know, it was my my little escapism. Yeah, you know? yeah. Nothing was happening very on. fast, but things were happening very yeah, consistently. Yeah, know, there's my little round. You know. Yeah. Gee, it shoots well. You know. Yeah. Well, you spend the time on it. Yeah. Um, I did get involved with a Hornady. Yep, yeah, uh, a Hornady Progressive Press many years ago. So you put a case in. Um, uh, through the powder, you know, you had to load the case in and load a projectile on. Mm. And, um, yeah, it had a primer tube and all that sort of thing. And okay. Did all that sort of thing and out the end would come a, a round, hopefully. Yeah, and it worked. Um, but, uh, yeah, I wasn't too happy with it. So, so it, had a, it was faster but you lost some control, lost some consistency? Oh, I think, yeah, I think you sort of lose a little bit of control, you know. It might be all right for... Say an IPSC rifle shoot where it's it's quite a run and gun type thing. Um, PRS it might be marginal. Yeah, just my thoughts on it. It might be marginal with the accuracy, but for you know bench press accuracy, no. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and in the F class side, I think you need bench press accuracy. Yeah. You know to keep up with them. Yeah. And I sold that and then went back to the the rock chucker style mm -hmm. press and just been sticking with that and uh, I've now just got two presses the old rock chucker and an old Lyman C frame press that I do the bullet seating with. 
you see your seat on one and you size on the other and those yeah. tyres just pretty much stay with yep. those presses. That's yep. right, yep. yeah. Yeah. What uh, sort of... Um, are you using a bushing type resizing die? What sort of sizing die are you using? It'd be different for you. You reload obviously a lot of different calibers, but yeah. do you have? Um, I've gone away from the bushing dies just for, um, I suppose, simplicity and simplicity cost. Simplicity, cost. Um, well, once you buy the dies, you know, you stick with them. But mm -hmm. when I got out of F class, when I sold the rifle, the dies, the uh, chamber reamer cases, you know, went with it. So um, I just went back to the standard uh, mm -hmm. Reading uh, full length seating die, mm -hmm. you know, full length and seating die. Mm -hmm. But I've since gone to the micrometer top for the them. seating die, yeah. Yeah, for the VLD seating uh, stem. Yep. Uh, yeah, they yeah, holds that VLD shaped projectile a, exactly a lot, right. lot more stable. Won't put the ring on the top. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Which is annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and how are you throwing powder? What are you? Uh, I got a. Um, well, I used to use the, the beam scale for a long time. Mm. Um, I came across a deal on a second hand RCBS light. Charge Master light. Char yeah. Charge Master light. Yeah. And the guy had made it. or got a different power pack for it. Put a little grey doodad in the in the power. Yep. Cord. Yeah. I think it just helps with that nice flow of. Yeah, electricity. electricity. So you're not getting as much swing on your scale. It's, That's it's right, more yeah. consistent. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, and, and you've been happy with that. Very happy. Yeah, I, I might plug it in the morning and load in the evening. Okay, afternoon. so you let it warm up. Yeah, all day. Yeah, yep. and it's obviously in an, a room, very temperature stable room, and, yep. and no wind and things like that. Oh, you've got to have no wind. Yeah, because even the wind, um, yeah, sends them off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah nice. And okay, um, so your so yeah. your equipment I've gone back changed. to basic. Going yep. back to basics. Yep. Um, yeah, got Reading dies, RCBS, uh, Forrester and Hornady. Yeah. I think the Hornady dies are a, a really good value die. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, oh, Reading dies are, you know, there's so much to choose from. You can go from the basics, you know, right up to the... Right through to the S-types. Uh, micrometer. Yeah, and the micrometer dies, yeah. Yeah, sure. Which are, which are, are you... Accurate. Uh, something I've been asking pretty much everyone. Are you annealing cases? I've never annealed. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. It's, it, yeah, it's, yeah, I've just never annealed and, um, yeah. Yeah, you've been able to get consistent loads over a life of brass and you haven't felt the, the need to do it. How, how, what is your brass life then? What are you, how long are you keeping a piece of brass for and how long are you loading it for before you look at, at getting new brass? Um, I'm getting up to ten reloads out of it. Okay, mostly, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's it. Yeah, I've, well, I've never annealed, so I've, I haven't seen the need to. Um, when I shot the F class, um, I had to turn the neck down because I had a very tight neck, and it was a very thin neck, and it just seemed to hold the, you know, the projectiles well, and it shot well, and. And so I've just never really worried about it. Mm. Mm. Some people uh, annul after each firing. That's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, it is. And those <laughs> annealing machines are not cheap. I mean, you can sort of do the the flame annealing stuff for, you know, I think it's, what's that, the, the easy annealers, they're around $400 or something. Yep. But then when you look at the, the amp annealers, the mm. electric... Oh, they're, they're induct, good dollars. They're, yeah, two grand or something yep. like that. So I saw one today, um, this morning. Uh, it, it's an annealing machine made in Africa, and I messaged the guy and said, "Where you know whereabouts are you?" And he's, "Oh, I'm in Africa. You know, do you want me to send you one? You know, the eight hundred dollars Australian." And mm. yeah, I said, "Well, have a think about it." Yeah, you know, okay. not that I anneal. But is that an induction annealer or is that a flame annealer? No, it's an induction annealer. Um, yeah, it's quite a good looking bit of kit. Yeah, you drop the case in the top, and you can see the neck, you yep. know, glow red, and then it just drops out. So okay. Yeah, it's nice. all timed. It, it, he's, he's sorted it out pretty much. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, that that's mm. so. It's this is what's great about reloading is the differences of opinion. You've got people who swear by annealing because they yeah. say that it's the only way they're able to get a consistent feel with their you know seating depth over yep. the life of the brass. Like it has a different mm -hmm. feel, but by annealing it each time, they're able to get that consistent feel. And then someone like yourself who's shot, you know. 
for for a, such a long period of time and at a high level in multiple different disciplines mm. and you've you've never even tried it and you haven't obviously seen the need to yet because i'm sure if you if you notice things changing drastically mm. between firings i'm sure you would have gone hunting for the answer and you would have been like well i need to find out why this has changed yeah. and why is my neck tension so different that it's affecting my load yeah. and i'm sure you would have you know wound up at trying and kneeling at some point but you haven't so you obviously haven't seen the need to do mm. that yeah um, yeah, oh, I haven't seen the need, and oh well, you know. If people want to do it, yeah, so be it. But yeah, yeah, oh, but yeah. And this style of shooting, it's you know you got to be precise with it, the precision rifle match. Um, but sometimes I sort of think, how can you tell the difference of a shot from an annealed case to? Yep. One that's been fired ten times and not annealed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're not. We've got we're so many variations. Yeah, out in the field. You know. We're not at the level yet where we're able to hold that level of wobble mm. off a barricade, you know, yeah. to a small enough degree or, you know, not making quite, you know, a stable enough position to be able to even warrant that. I, I totally I yeah. totally hear what you're saying. And that's something I've had to let go. Like my personality was wanting that one whole group and wanting mm -hmm. that gun to be, you know, dead nuts zeroed every single time. And then yeah. you kind of start to go, you know what, I'm just going to get these loads together. And if it lands somewhere inside that one inch circle at a hundred, whatever, let's call that good to go and get yeah. a velocity and then start shooting steel. Like That's letting it. go of the worry of the load. Cause then yeah. that'll plague you, you know, if, you, if oh, you're doubting right. it. Yeah. But I think that's why maybe some of these guys that are kneeling after every firing, they're doing it f sometimes for peace of mind as well. They're doing it to yep. not have that mm. doubt about mm. their loads being different from the last time they were at a match. They, you know, right. they, they go, well, I did the same process 10 times, so mm. this is going to be the same result. And that's just a peace of mind thing, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you just um, reminded me of something. Consistency is, you know, the, the, is the best way to – key. Mm. it's the key to accuracy. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't have different brands of brass, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> it doesn't work. I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, why is this going there? Why is it, you know, it's yeah. not shooting. Oh, it gives all your brass. Oh, well, you got Federal, you got, you know, Hornady, you got yeah. Starline, you know. Every different <laughs> one. Yeah. yeah. Pick some, so, pick so one and run with it. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And don't mix them up, you know. Um, yeah. But, um, well, I don't doubt annealing works, mm. you know. I, I don't doubt it whatsoever because um, it does work. But yeah. I've. Well, I personally haven't seen the need for it. So. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. about on the hunting side of things? I haven't really spoken to anyone on this podcast too much yet about hunting. You've done a lot of hunting yourself. Um, how do you go about choosing components? Like let's say choosing a projectile for hunting. Mm. Now that becomes a little bit more complicated because obviously you've got, you want something that shoots accurately yep. and you want something that shoots consistently, but then yep. you need something that performs on game yep. that has you know the the desired effect on the type of game that you're shooting yeah what are you looking for in a hunting projectile across you know i mean let's you know, happy to talk varmint hunting happy to talk yeah. larger game whatever you've yeah. had experience with yeah what are you uh, looking for there well you you definitely can't use a target bullet you mm. know i've had to back up a guy you know out shooting one night and, and all i had well i had a 260 mm. and i had um um uh, Oh, just a is a pure target bullet. These bullets were just zipping straight through. Not, it's not putting any 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 no, energy into exploding. the animal. They were going straight through. You, you still get energy in there in the mm. head, you know. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, you know, a, a hunting bullet just explodes. That's you know, yeah. Um, you know, you want a quick kill. Yeah. Something that gets in there explodes. You know, releases the energy. Yep. And um, yeah, it does all the damage to the vitals. You know, yeah. whether it be your brain or heart. You know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely you cannot use target bullets. Well, yeah. There we go. I can't say you cannot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, go for one of the uh, like the E or the M uh, X X's. Yeah. X's something uh, that's similar but still has a yeah. hunting pedigree. Yeah. You, you probably find that you know going from your target to your hunting round, they're a very similar projectile, mm -hmm. but they're just Slightly different. They mm. will explode a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, the interlocks, I mm -hmm. believe, you know, they, you know, they're designed to get in but mm -hmm. stay together. Mm -hmm. So you know, they're better on bigger a game. game. Yeah, yep. bigger, heavier game. Yeah. So you really got to do a little bit of homework, you know. 
on the type of game you're the type you're of shooting. game you're shooting. Yeah, yeah. Like Spear put out, uh, Sierra put out the Superu. Mm -hmm. You know, fabulously accurate and you know designed to get in there, pop open, mm -hmm. and deliver the goods. Yeah, for well, sure. For professional roo shooting, you've got to shoot in the head anyway. Yeah. Yep. But yeah, um, oh, yeah. I've I've noticed that as well. As far as um, I feel like. Uh, because a lot of the stuff in our magazines or the things we see online comes from America, yep. um, and they shoot a lot of game over there that's probably a lot bigger than our game here in, oh, in, yeah. in general. Yep. Um, yeah, they do have varmint hunting as well, and they mm. do have, and, and we do have also have bigger stuff. You know, you can shoot buffalo here in Australia, you can, you know, mm. wild horses, <coughs> or you know, whatever it is that you might be culling. Um, yep. It can be some big animals, some scrub bull. Mm. But that's very specific, I think. Um, the general shooting in Australia, everything from, you know, y your varmint stuff, your cats and foxes and rabbits through mm -hmm. to y your deer species. Yeah. M majority of them, and even pigs to yeah, a lesser degree. Pig, pig, goat, deer. Pig, yeah. goat, deer. That sort mm -hmm. of all falls into, I see a lot of people over, uh, well, what's the word, sort of going for a projectile that's too stoutly made or something that's, you yeah. know, holds mm -hmm. together so well and has deep penetration. Yep. And goes out the other side of the animal and doesn't make a you know any energy instant clean instant kill. Clean kill. Mm. Yeah, and great if you're maybe shooting something quartering away from you, or if you've got it straight through the shoulder bone and you're getting a lot of impact. But if you you know slip it behind the shoulder just through some vitals and then it doesn't hit any bone and there's nothing to open that projectile up, yeah. like you're saying, it's it's slipping straight through and there's yeah. not putting any energy in it. So I've found that for myself for the the hunting I've done and I've helped with some. Uh, deer culling and mm -hmm. things like that i've been using 130 grain hollow point spears in my 308 which is a very light Fabulous. projectile for yep. a 308 mm -hmm. and they like a flying bucket big open That's hollow point in the front yep. and they actually just knock things over and, and pigs i've shot yep. them with they, they've been fab you've experienced have you had used that same projectile as well um hornady i think had a 130 grain mm -hmm. similar projectile or it might be sierra sierra's got 135 grain Right. One as well. I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. maybe, maybe, maybe Hornady did as well. But yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, because um, I, was, I was in. We moved to Queensland back in 2012, and I, I got a job with Longreach Council as a ranger. So yeah, awesome. I was involved in 1080 baiting. You know, um, any pigs in the common, you know, go out there shoot them. Goats. Um, anyway, when I did the 1080 uh, course, a two day course. There's a couple of guys, uh, they had helicopter um, patches on their shoulders. And I said, oh, guys, you know, do you do the shooting out of the helicopters? Yeah, and, um, you know, we're going to do the baiting as well, where they throw the baits out, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I said, oh, you know, use 308, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I said, what projectile do you use? You know, 180 grand? I said, nah. <laughs> 130, I'm sure it's 130 Hornady soft point. Yeah, okay. I said, Really? I said, yeah, they, they get in, they just open up and they just pole axe whatever we hit, you know. Yeah. As well, but, you know, you hit a buff in the head, it's got to be in the right spot in the head, sort mm. of behind the ear to get in there or, mm -hmm. um, you know, corded or through the top, you know, mm. just be next to the spine. Yeah. And so I went, went to Long Reach and bought a box of those and loaded them up in my 308. And, uh, Paul, there's uh, goats eating the roses out at the race course. Go get rid of them. You know, yeah. oh, all right, 308, la, 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 out the window, about 300 metres, you know, <laughs> dial yeah. in a bit of elevation, bang, 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 you know, and the holes he's punched into them, mm. or punched out of them, you know. Yeah, devastating. You know, and they, they just drop like, they just drop, you know, and that's what you want, you know. That's what you want, yeah. You don't want to be chasing a blood trail and no. going after something, yeah. And that's shooting, you know, out of a vehicle, so I had a, a good rest and, and I've noticed with goats, you know, you pick the, the lead one and the pigs, you pick the lead animal. Yeah. And um, they sort of stand around and oh, what do we do now, you know? Mm. <laughs> so you've got more time to mm. follow up shots on other goats, yeah. pigs, you know. For sure. And I'm sure there is times where I've never shot up in, you know, up the Cape or anywhere up there where when Queensland maybe where big pigs have got a lot of mud baked on the side mm -hmm. of them or even in the territory, whatever, maybe they get that really hard crust on the outside and yep. maybe I would find that those 130 hollow points don't penetrate well enough. Mm -hmm. So then that's going to be an example where you, you need to know 
the area you're shooting and the game you're shooting. Yeah. So we're not. So we don't want to you know, sort of put this podcast out there to say to people blanket statement. Use use something a bit lighter that, that opens up. But I've exactly just seen. Right. Yeah. In general, I feel like people worry too much about penetration and not enough about, you know, expansion and, and, yeah. and energy in the yeah. game. Yeah, as, a, as a general blanket statement for what I've seen hunted here in South Australia and New mm. South Wales, yeah. the hunting I've done and the people I've been with. Yeah. So. Yeah, we're, we're not saying use this projector. No, <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah, we could probably get in quite a bit of trouble for that. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. yeah, and... Accuracy requirements for a hunting low, what would you be happy to take out in the field with a carry rifle accuracy-wise compared to maybe a competition setup? I oh, still, I'll go for the most accurate load, mm -hmm. whether it's slow or fast, you know. Um, just got to find that node under an inch. You've got to, you know, got to be under an inch. Some people are happy with minute of varmint, you know. There's a yeah. two-inch load, but no, I'm not happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> You want that one, so you want to know that if if you miss something, it's it's your you, fault. It's yeah. your fault. Yeah, yeah, not the if rifle. You've done something, or you know, you didn't see that gust of wind came through, and you still pulled the shot, or you know, yeah, squeeze the shot off, you know, yeah, and you just missed. But no, uh, I, I always strive for that accurate load. Yeah. Has there been anything in your reloading process that you don't do now that you maybe previously did that you don't? think is worthwhile anymore something that doesn't get you the gain for the time and effort that it took is there anything that you know maybe maybe it was weight sorting projectiles or weight sorting cases or you know you know skimming primer pockets and things like that is there anything that you used to do that you were when you were really chasing that most accuracy for your f class that you now don't do because you don't see the comeback for it oh, you have to <laughs> i've dialed back on quite a bit um I used to do the inside and outside of the uh, primer flash holes because mm -hmm. usually the um, the flash hole is is just a punched hole. Yep. And there's um, often often a little burr in there. I used to clean those off. Just give the um, the primer flash hole where you seat the primer just a little tweak. And it just bevels the edge just a little bit. Yeah. I never uniform the primer pocket. Uh, pockets themselves, um, I would just take the carbon out, mm -hmm. you know, and just over time, you know, you, you're just going slightly deeper and deeper. Whereas I've heard some people they just bore straight into them and they so think they've you know just about gone through the bottom of the case. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I don't. When I think that. Uh, primer pockets pretty cruddy. I'll, I'll just clean it out, you know. Yeah, but you're not worrying about that flash hole as much as you, you no, used to anymore. If you can no. see through it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I always tumble the brass, yep. but I size and then tumble, you know, to get the sizing lube off. Mm -hmm. uh, I always do that. I like nice shiny brass. You yeah, know. everything shiny looks good. You know, yeah. <laughs> it shoots better. Yeah, that's right. If it, look, <laughs> if it looks good, it shoots better. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Um, uh, that's probably it. Um, and backing off from, uh, you know, bushing dies, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd yeah. Just sort of, cause we, we traveled, you know, from 2012, you know, I had to unload, you know, quite a bit of gear. Um, and then from 2015, you know, up until, well, last year we, we traveled quite a bit and, uh, I was very restricted on what I could take, so I narrowed it down to a minimum. But I still had the um, 10 10 press uh, uh, beam scale mm -hmm. that was there, you know, loading dies that, you know, suited all my brass, <coughs> two presses. Mm -hmm. um, so th that's probably why I've sort of slowed down a bit. You yeah. Know. The simplicity of it. And yeah, yeah, just turn it sim simple. <coughs> yeah. What is the biggest mistake you see a lot of new reloaders making? Not seeding primers properly. Okay. Um, Not seeding them the deep enough deep and then, enough. And then it yeah, absorbs some energy as it goes forward yeah. and, and then it doesn't cause a hang fire. Yep. yep, hang fire. And uh, possibly not knowing how to set the dies, seeding dies up. Um, oh, one one 
guy that just started, you know, and um, organised the press for him and dies and all this sort of thing. Paul, oh, here's a picture of my, um, how do I mean, my brass, you know, I'm trying to seat two, two, threes and just keeps concertining the brass. I said, stop right there, I'll be right over. So yeah. went over there. He just had the die set way too low. Yeah. And the shoulder was bumping inside the die and it was just crushing. Oh, crushing. right. And some guys just, if it doesn't go. They'll just keep pushing on it. Keep pushing. Yeah. You know, on the press. Um, yeah, that and um, setting the die up to uh, push the shoulder back too far. I, I set him to no more than two thou, mm -hmm. two thou, just so that you get a nice little feel, you know, mm -hmm. the, they load nicely as you're cycling the bolt. Yeah. Yeah, some send them back too far. That can cause you hang fire, you know, misfire. So, so what is what happens if you do bump the shoulder too too far? If you're overworking that shoulder when you after you fired your case and then you you bump it back and let's say you've bumped it like you're saying way too far, what what does that cause? Does it miss? Does it well, the, deform the brass? Or um, if you go way too far, which is, is hard to do because the, the a lot of the manufacturers say is set the die to the uh, shell holder. So you can't actually get the piece yeah. of brass any further in. Yeah, you so can't yeah. get any further. Um, but it can cause the misfires. There's just too much um, uh, area between the shoulder and the, and the chamber wall. So it doesn't seal the chamber wall properly. Yeah. And then, yeah. It, it, the primer, um, the firing pin pushes the case forward and... Um, and Add that to not seating the primer properly. Mm -hmm. The firing pin's trying to seat the primer. Yeah. So it just runs out of energy. It can't fire it, you know. Mm. So, that, yeah, that, that's probably the biggest biggest mistake. Um, yeah. Yeah, well that's, that's, no, that's really good. That's, I hadn't really thought about the, the primer, seating the primers being, being an issue. I, I use a hand primer and obviously yep. squeeze it until you, you sort of, I feel it stop. Mm -hmm. Sort of that like that hard point there, and yeah. I've never really played too much with you know yep. adjusting that at all. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that is you're right. There's sometimes where you get one that's a little bit sticky and a little bit tight, and you could maybe just go, "Oh, I'm gonna leave that there." But then you give it maybe a little bit more of a squeeze, and you feel it kind of settle where the rest that's of it. them, yeah. rest of them have. Yeah, I sort of feel them in, and then just give it that little eek. yeah <laughs> at the end <laughs> makes that little eek. yeah. Are you hand your hand priming as yeah, well? Yeah, I hand prime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's you know good gives feel. you the most feel. Mm. Okay, I've tried the presses, but it's to me it's just a little bit too not so much agri agricultural, but you've got a lot of pressure there and yeah, on a small area. Yeah, in a small area. Yep. Yeah, and you don't want to go damaging the primer. Yeah, mm. if someone was looking at um, they've got a rifle, they want to do up a load, and mm -hmm. they're sort of looking at brass, powder, primers, and projectiles. Where is one area there that you're not willing to compromise on? So you, are you happy to have cheaper budget brass or are you one of those people that always wants Lapua brass? Are you one of those people that wants real premium projectile or can you have a cheaper projectile? Like, you know, where, which is the area that you're not willing to compromise on, on, on quality for cost? Well, sure, you can go Lapua. You know, it's very well-made brass. Norma, um, Peterson, that's new in Australia, I think. Yeah. Um, I go Hornady because mm -hmm. of the cost. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a millionaire, so. <laughs> yep. Um, Hornady Starline. Mm -hmm. All you have to do with that brass is just prep it. Mm -hmm. Do the flash holes. You know, buy a few b more bits of equipment. Do the inside of the flash hole, outside, mm -hmm. uh, and weight sort it. Find a mate that's got a you know half decent scale and just sit there, you know, and weight sort them. Yep. And you you want to um, keep those weights very close together. So you're throwing out some outliers, or you're making oh, two no, different well, batches, or you might out of a box of you know a hundred, you might make three different batches, and you've got some real um, you know way out weight brass cases. Keep them for fowlers. Um, you know, you come to a match. Your barrel's clean. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> get some you know, carbon down there. Yeah, get a bit of carbon down there. Yeah. Yeah, get it squeaky dirty. Yeah. You know, and um, use that brass, you know, set it aside for that sort of thing. Or um, you're practicing your seating depth or 
uh, turn it into dummy rounds for dry fire practice, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah. But then keep your brass, you know, batch sorted. Okay. You know, if you, you know, you've got five left of a batch, and then you're going into the next batch, just put that five aside, so it doesn't get mixed up in the magazine. Mm-hmm. Start on a new box of brass, mm-hmm. but, you know, loaded rounds mm-hmm. that are all batch weighted. Yeah. You know. You don't have to go to the, you know, the high-end stuff. Yeah. Especially when you're starting out, mm-hmm. you know. Because you're going to ruin a few pieces. You're going to mess something up or That's make it, a mistake. Yeah. yeah. And, and well, you know, um, like this guy that I helped at Ma- uh, Mount Barker. Oh, you got to buy, you know, Lapua brass. He bought Lapua, Peterson and Starline. Yeah. Bought uh, Lapua Sinea projectiles. Mm-hmm. And he'd never shot a rifle in his life. Yeah, right. You know, he's got $100 a box projectiles. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the most expensive brass and he might not like shooting in the end. Yeah. You know, he might get frustrated. With the process Why of reloading that and just want to buy factory ammo and have it done yeah. for him. Yeah. 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 I did buy factory ammo and I said, well, we can use this this brand for running your barrel in. Um, you bought some match ammo. Right, we'll shoot a match with that. You know, then and then we'll start your reloading process. You know, mm-hmm. and well, he's now a happy camper. Yeah, he's re- he's reloading happily now. He's, yeah, yeah, but yeah, really, when you're starting out, just start with the basics. Mm-hmm. The basics, you know. Um, Hornady put out a good projectile. Mm-hmm. You know, there's so many thoughts of you know the Hornady blow up. You know. This brand blows up, you know, yeah. when the, you know, just as it gets out the barrel. Well, you know, maybe a barrel's too long. Yeah, <laughs> maybe the barrel's <laughs> over twisted. Yeah, if you if you just read what's out there on the internet, everyone has had. It's like cars. Everyone's had an experience or a good experience or a bad experience with a certain brand. Yeah, you need to kind of go on your own experience plus sort of maybe combining that with the general mass. You mm. know, there, there's going to be those outliers. There's going to be people that said I flat out could not get that brand of projectile shirt, or I've, mm. I've had heaps of problems with them, or mm. whatever. But they, there might be extremities. There might be you know one bad batch or whatever. Yeah, y- you're right. You can start with the the more basics. And I think that's a, a big aim of this podcast is to just encourage people to just get out and have a go with what they might have lying around as far as equipment goes, and then you know, get some components together, do the research, and that's then it. get yourself a, a starting point. Yeah. And once you start, that's where your knowledge grows quickly because once you see it all happening in front of you, yeah. and you start seeing the effects of a little bit more powder or, or, you know, a little the seating depth change or things like that. You start That's to it. go, okay, I see what's happening when I change, you know, A, B or C. Yeah. And then you can go, all right, well, now that I've got my head around that, it's time for maybe, you know, upgrade upgrade some components, upgrade, mm. you know, the, the reloading equipment, things like that, and reload and upgrade as you, as you make that journey. That's right. Jumping in the deep end, like you're saying, mm. before you even know if you're going to enjoy the process. That's it. Yeah. Is a little bit daunting. Then, then there's other people that say the, Buy once, cry once theory. You know, they go, I'm well, if I'm going... totally gonna... for that. Yeah. But but oh. that needs to come... I think buy once, cry once works if you already have a bit of an, a baseline. You've mm. got a baseline of what's going on and then you can go, all right, now I'm going to dive in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, buy once, cry once. The, um, you come out with a, a, a cheap little rifle that's, you know oh, yeah, the gun shop really wanted to sell me this, you know, and they said, oh, I could do everything with it. Mm. And uh, you get to the range and, oh, I've never shot this before. I've never been to a range, I've, you know. And they said, oh, this scope's really good, you know, and that's the buy once, cry once. Right. You know. Your it, components are going to stay with you. Your, yeah. Your, your yeah. rifle, and, and yeah. I know you and I agree on this very much, so is is your glass, your scope, oh, what absolutely. you're looking through. Absolutely. If, if you, you, if you're looking at putting a rifle together, even if it's hunting, even if it's competition shooting, I fully believe that people should be putting their money into their scope first. That's the product that I bought first for my yep. build. And right. I was like, okay. that's, you know, I'm going to pay what I could at yeah. the time yep. for my scope. And then I'm actually going to buy the rifle after that. So, yep. mm-hmm. and I'm not telling everyone to do it that way, but I think, yeah, you're right. Your glass and your rifle, that's going to be yeah. a, a mainstay. Yeah. And also, Really, really, if, if you're starting out in this sporting sport, 
go around to a few ranges and, and see what is on offer. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you might come out and see the PRS. Oh, that's not for me. You go to a shotgun club. Oh, heck, that mm. looks like fun. Mm. You know, I think I'll, I'll have a go at that. Yeah. But a lot of people in the clubs will say, "Here, have a go with my shotgun." You know, you you look like the same build as me. Have a go with mine. Mm. Here's a club gun. You know, here's a real cheap gun. You go bang it. Oh, gee, that thump, that hurt. You know, yeah. but his rifle, but shotgun shoots real nice. You know. Yeah. Okay. That yeah. sort of thing. Get out but and try some other stuff. The 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 optics and 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 the rifle be with you for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um. The, the reloading components, sure, you can start at the basis mm. and then, right, you know, after a year, gee willikers, I'm going to just fine-tune this. Mm. Ring, ring, hello, I want another set of dies, you know. Yeah. Let's, let's try this, you know, and, and take it from there. Yeah. But yeah. The basic stuff will still yeah. get you around to go bang That's and right. it will still <laughs> teach you what you need to do. And yeah. yeah. A poor guy came, well, not poor guy, a young lad came up to Mount Barker and... Uh, he got sold a Remington. It's one of those triangular barreled ones. Yeah, I know the one you're the talking about. With the slots cut in them. Yeah. And uh, 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 a name brand scope. And, uh, oh, Paul, you know, one guy was trying to get him on target. Here, yeah, give me a go. I got him on target. And this was meant to be quarter inch clicks. I gave it two clicks and it bounced about four inches across the other side of the target. Okay, so the scope and was that flat is, out not tracking. That is... That is Buy once, cry once. To me, he's bought that. It's it's garbage, you know. Yeah. Um, if he spent another two hundred dollars and you know three four hundred dollars, he would have been better off, mm-hmm. in, you know, been a lot happier. Way further you know. ahead than having to return that scope and up, upgrade it again. Yeah. yeah, 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 that's right. So yeah, yeah. awesome, mate. Totally believe in that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I once cry once, everyone. Yeah, well, <laughs> we'll probably start to, to wrap it up, mate. It's been Okey awesome dokey. for you to jump on after a, a long, hot day of shooting. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, thanks for inviting me. No, nah, no worries, mate. Anytime, great. we'll probably have you back another time. It'd be yep. cool to have some people that sort of jump on with me regularly. Yep. Uh, is there any parting advice you've got for new up-and-coming reloaders or maybe an advanced reloader that is wanting to try something new or maybe questioning their process? What is there? Any wisdom you got for us here at the end that in your journeys you found? Well, advanced people they they tend to know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Pardon me. Um, an up and coming reloader, have a look around, ask questions before you go out and spend that money. You know, listen to these podcasts. You know, um, there, there's some really good podcasts on it. You know. There's a lot of YouTube channels out a there as well. A lot of well. YouTube, yeah. Yeah, Projectile Warehouse yeah, YouTube Projectile's channel. Yeah, got a really good YouTube channel yeah. on that's very Ultimate informative. Ultimate Reloader as well. That, yep. oh, he's got a great YouTube, yeah. Um, ask a lot of questions before you spend your money, mm-hmm. you know. But if you're going to buy something, buy something that will last and get a good, good brand, mm-hmm. you know. A good solid press is a good base. Mm-hmm. It'll never wear out, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, if you if you're reloading, you know, I think yeah, I think the people that are already into it that you know been re- reloading for years, they know what they're doing. So yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Awesome. Well, some might know what they're doing. Yeah, some. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Well, at least have a different opinion, isn't it? There, you That's you still right. find yeah. that at the top end, like even yeah. people that are shooting at a high level and reloading at a high level still can have quite varied opinions from other people at that same level, which yep. is, which I find fascinating and exciting as well because it's there's so many different ways to to do this. So. Yeah. Also, I re- I recommend buying the Hornady latest reloading manual. That's full of information. That is a really good start. It, it read that right up until your your load data starts, and uh, that, that'd be a really good start. Mm-hmm. Get that manual. It, it it really tells you the whole gamut of reloading. So you've got something up top, you know, to start with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right, mate. No, nah, thank you so much. No, you're Cheers. welcome. Appreciate it. Yeah. Hope you uh, you shooting tomorrow. Oh, for sure. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I hope you yeah, have a have a great day. <laughs> yeah, good. The 22. <laughs> Fun. 
<laughs> All right, mate. Well, yeah. no, thank you for joining us. Um, yeah. Thank you to Projectile Warehouse for making this podcast possible. Yeah, thanks, Projectile Warehouse. Yeah, Fabulous. really, really appreciate what they do for the sport. And um, oh, yeah, it's full on. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. making making this podcast possible as well. So yeah. appreciate Fabulous. them, and we'll we'll talk to you soon. Beauty, catch you, mate. See ya. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the From the Bench podcast presented by Projectile Warehouse. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel and also follow all of our social medias for updates and upcoming episodes. We hope you're enjoying the journey of reloading as much as we are and we'll catch you on the next episode.